For those who don't know me, my name is Carrie Inda, and I will talk about um, forensic science and a career in forensic science tonight. So a little bit about me, I am, well, I was born on Oahu, but uh, when I was two, my dad worked for IBM. So we moved, the, the whole family moved to Kauai. Um, I lived in Wailua Homesteads on the Kapa'a side, but I ended up going to Wilcox and Kauai High School because my parents worked in, in Lihui. So I went to Kauai High School. I then, um, when I graduated Kauai High School, I went to University of Oregon, like many people in Hawaii do. Uh, <laughs> I, I got into various colleges, but um, because of tuition and everything, it seemed like the best fit at the time. So I went to University of Oregon and I studied chemistry and biology. Uh, following that, um, I actually did not know what I was gonna do. I was pre-med um, and I think I told my classes before I was pre-med and I volunteered at a hospital in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, and it was then I realized, well, I started to realize pre-med might not be for me. Um, so I graduated from, uh, I got my bachelor's and then I decided I'm going to go travel and just <laughs> do something totally different. So I went to Waseda University or Waseda Daigaku in Tokyo, Japan, where I just studied everything non-science. I studied uh, art history, the language, linguistics, um, and just lived there um, and immersed myself in the culture. Uh, which was a great experience. I learned a lot about myself. I thought being Japanese American, I would kind of just kind of fit in, but I didn't. And I, I, I never felt so American in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it really opened my eyes to who I am and who I want to be. Um, so when I came back to the States, I was, I had a lot more focus. And that's when I decided I'm going to apply to graduate school and I wanna study forensic science. So I, I applied to the George Washington University uh, and John Jay and um, I got my acceptance letter. My first choice was GW. So I got my acceptance letter and um, attended the university. I got my master's of science in forensic science there where I concentrated in forensic molecular biology. Um, my thesis there was uh, I was measuring degradation rates between nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. So I spent like three years doing that. Um, while on the East Coast, I worked out a couple of labs there too, forensic labs. One was the Bodhi Technology Group. Um, they, they do forensic cases as well, but they also do forensic research. And I was on the research side. We did um, a research, but forensic botanical research. Uh, I also worked for the Commonwealth of Virginia, where I was a laboratory technician in their DNA unit. So I was pretty much their support staff where I um, did their ordering and clean up the lab and autoclave scissors and tweezers. Um, and I, I put gels together for them. So I was, uh, I learned a lot doing that. So I graduated from I got my master's and that's when I started applying for uh, forensic analyst jobs or criminalist jobs. And I pretty much applied everywhere. I was, I was not really picky on where I wanted to live. I mean, to be honest, I did wanna stay in Washington DC. I just loved living there, um, but I was open to, to pretty much anything. And I was lucky enough to uh, get a phone call from LA, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department and they asked me if I would like to join them um, as a criminalist in their DNA unit. And I remember I was on the phone and I told the lady, shut up. And I, it just came out of my mouth and uh, she was just quiet. And I realized what I had done. I mean, I was in my early twenties and I, you know, I was silly like that, but that didn't prevent them from still hiring me. Hiring me. Um, I spent about 18 years there. I started off in their DNA unit. I promoted to supervisor. Um, I supervised the DNA unit as well as the narcotics unit. Um, and year 18 is when I decided to leave. 
Um, that was around the time that the pandemic hit and we kind of uh, reassessed our family life. I have a husband and three kids um, and my we, we had really had no family on the mainland and all of my family was here and all of my husband's family is in Florida. So it was kind of like one or the other. And my husband loves Hawaii. So <laughs> we ended up here. Um, when I first moved here, I luckily got a job with DPAA. DPAA is the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. I know that's a lot of words, but in a nutshell, it's the, um, lab on Hickam Air Force Base that identifies missing soldiers with skeletal remains found uh, in different areas around the world. Um, most of the remains in the laboratory right now are from World War II, Korean War, and uh, Vietnam, Vietnam War. Uh, so I wish I could show you a picture, but it, it's it's an amazing laboratory. I think it's the biggest an forensic anthropology lab in the world. Um, it's just rows and rows of skeletal remains. And it's, it's, it's pretty heavy. It was heavy stuff. And it, my job there was to sample these um, exhumed remains um, for DNA analysis. And hopefully it would match a relative and then they would get closure. Uh, while I was working there, I did see a position pop open at Chaminade University, and for a while, I had been having this desire to teach. So I thought I would apply, and I was so lucky to um, be offered a position. So currently, I am a lecturer in the Forensic Sciences Department at Chaminade University. Last fall and this spring was my first academic year, and it has been completely amazing. I, it's everything I have wanted um, as far as a teaching career, and my students are just phenomenal. I just love them absorbing my, my experiences and what the knowledge I can share with them, um, and I love seeing their enthusiasm for the field. Well, that was a long about me. <laughs> but uh, what is forensic? So I, I apologize for my current students. This may be review for you. Um, but forensics, in a nutshell, is the application of science to legal matters. And it can be any science. It can be chemistry, biology, physics, a combination of that, biophysics, biochemistry, what have you. Uh, and it's a application to legal matters. In a crime lab, we have different disciplines. Um, so I was in the DNA unit, which is also biology, but there's also fingerprints, trace, which are hairs, fibers, glass, paint, it can be soils. We have firearm and tool marks, a photography section, Chemistry sections, which cover toxicology, narcotics, and blood alcohol. And then we also have question documents. Question documents is basically handwriting analysis or looking at like counterfeit money or the paper materials. So I'm gonna first talk about my time with LA County Sheriff's Department just because that was the majority of my career in forensics. I was hired as a criminalist and a criminalist is a person who collects, preserves and analyzes physical and biological evidence. And when once we collect this evidence, we will analyze it to see if it has any probative value in a court, in a criminal court trial, okay? This is a beautiful building. This is the LA County Sheriff's Crime Laboratory, the outside of it. Um, it is huge. It is a total of five floors, but um, you count four, but there's a basement. I would say two thirds of it is LA County Sheriff's Department. About a third of it is actually LAPD, which is LA Los Angeles City's uh, crime lab. So we shared floors. We did not share spaces 
but we shared floors. And what's interesting about this building is that this floor right here, part of it is the Forensic Science Department of California State University, um, or yeah, California State University of Los Angeles. Uh, they have a graduate program and their classrooms are on the bottom floor of the crime lab. And as you can imagine, they are so lucky because we have visiting lecturers so easily accessible that we just walk downstairs and give a quick lecture and go back up and they hear real life, real time experiences. Also, they get a lot of networking there because they, you know, they see us a lot. So they're able to maybe do volunteer work or internships right, right there, right on campus. So it's really, really convenient. Actually, one of my students is applying to um, do some volunteer work there, which I hope she can get. LA County is huge. Um, the population is over 10 million people. And just to give you some reference, Honolulu County uh, is less than 1 million. It's about, I think it's 975,000 people. So it's over 10 million people. It's over 4,000 square miles of geographical area. And I don't know if you're familiar with Los Angeles County, but it covers everything from the beautiful beach areas, Malibu, Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach, all the way up north to the desert area, which is Palmdale and Lancaster, um, West Hollywood, Compton, Long Beach, and all the way east to Pomona. So when we would get a, a call for a crime scene, you, you're praying that they don't say Palmdale or Lancaster because that will automatically add two and a half to three hours to your crime scene. And that's one way, okay? Uh, and that's without traffic. So you just hope they don't say Lancaster, but unfortunately a lot of crime happens up there. So we do end up going there a lot but it's just part of the job. Okay, so there's a phenomenon called the CSI effect. And what it is, is when these TV shows started coming out, this is the first CSI. Many of you, jo um, is your name Jovelin or Joveline? Joveline. Joveline, you were not born yet. Uh, this was, I think it came out in 01. But anyway, when th this show kind of started the whole frenzy um, and people were so interested in forensics and this affected the jurors ability to um, grasp, grasp that we cannot complete a case in 24 hours. Well, most times we cannot, um, we don't work in the dark like this. We don't dress like that. Um, so when we would testify on our analyses, um, they would already have this preconceived notion that, oh my goodness, you might not be doing your job. But in actuality, this is what we look like. Normal people, okay? <laughs> uh, these are my former coworkers, Dr. Coleman, Ken Sewell. I mean, we, we, we're efficient. We try to do a good job, but we do not, um, Put out or finish a case in 24 hours. That's just not possible. And as you can imagine, a big county like Los Angeles, we have backlogs of thousands and thousands of cases. So when I was a supervisor in DNA and a detective called and said, well, how much longer do I have to wait for my DNA results? We automatically said 60 days. That's like minimum. In the DNA section, when I started in 2001, there were 12 of us, 12 criminalists in the DNA section, and um, maybe 15 of us covering the entire county to process crime scenes, which meant we're up on, on top of the rotation list a lot quicker. Now there's 55 to 60 criminalists in the DNA section. Uh, just to compare, HPD has 18 criminalists in their DNA unit. We had four technicians 
and two operations assistants. Uh, so we need this huge team of people just to run uh, all the DNA cases um, for LA County. And even with 55 to 60 criminalists, there's still a backlog. And I think there will always be a backlog. You may wonder how many crime scenes do we go to? Well, I approximated there were about 30 to 40 field investigations per month. And if you divvy that up amongst like 20 criminalists, you might go out two or three times a week, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you have, if you work your eight hour shift or 10 hour shift, and right after that, you're going to a crime scene, that's a long day. And I remember I used to start at 7 a.m. and I would, my end of shift would be 3.30. And of course, at 2.45, a call comes in, you're rolling out to Compton and you're there till 3 a.m. the next morning. So two to three field investigations a week is very tiring. Uh, LA County has approximately three to 400 homicides per year. Um, and this does not include assaults, sexual assaults. Uh, attempted homicides, robberies, uh, suspicious circumstances, missing persons, all of these types of cases, not just homicides, even though that gets the most uh, um, um, calculations for uh, stats like that. Uh, there are many different types of crimes that get processed by crime by criminalists or CSIs. So I put this picture up because uh, it reminded me of one of my crime scenes. There's never a dull moment, never a dull moment. Uh, I was called out to a crime scene. It was a gang rape in a motel off the 110 freeway. And we processed the room and uh, the detective said, I need for you to check the dumpster for empty alcohol containers and used condoms. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but that's her job. So I am inside of the dumpster looking for stuff. I mean, they're helping me. They're getting the bags out while I'm in there. And lo and behold, there's a six pack of empty beer bottles with two condoms on it. <laughs> I'm like, how did you know? But uh, yeah, um, one day you could be in a dumpster and the next day you could have to put on your suit because you have to testify in court. That's just how it is. Part of her job is testifying. Um, it's a very important job. I feel like this is kind of like it's, it's, it's where it culminates because all of your hard work, all of your precision and accuracy all comes down to this. Are you going to relay to the juror that what you did was correctly done? Did you follow policy? Did you have contamination? Hopefully not. Did you open the package properly? Um, and also when you do lab analyses, what does your data show? Are you able to explain to the juror all of these numbers, all of these um, technical things that you've done so that they can understand and make a, a solid decision? So um, very important part of our job. Okay, I just wanted to show you some things that we might come across as a criminalist or CSI in the DNA unit. I have analyzed so many of these. I have taken so many pictures of knives just like these. Um, but these are great pieces of evidence because you may have victim DNA here and maybe some suspect DNA. Or maybe some hair is attached to it. That would be great too. Lots of these. Another great piece of evidence because on the interior, interior you may have suspect DNA and on the exterior you may have victim DNA. Lots of these and 
lots of these um, get dusted for fingerprints too. Okay, I do want to mention that if you're in the DNA unit, you spend a lot of time at the microscope. And if you're looking through the microscope for an hour or two after lunch, you better hope you don't fall asleep because finding that one sperm cell head can take a long time. But that circle right there, that's a sperm cell head. Um, my class knows the tail falls off at some point. So we're looking for these sperm cell heads. These right here are epithelial cells or skin cells and maybe could be victim, uh, could have victim DNA in it. Um, we use things like alternate light sources. There are special lights that um, shine at different wavelengths and they cause different biological stains to light up just like that. Um, we use a lot of this reagent, it's called Castlemeyer or phenothelene. We use this both in the crime scene and in the inside of the lab. This is a presumptive test for blood. It's a quick indicator if blood is present or not. It does not tell you if it's human blood or dog blood or bird blood, but it just tells you blood is present and that's very useful. We might come across something like this in a crime scene. Um, this is a photo straight from the O.J. Simpson case. If I came across this, this sidewalk right here, I would just close my eyes and be like, oh, make this go away <laughs> because uh, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of different shoe impressions, pattern transfers. Um, there's maybe some drips involved. This would take a long time to process because you need to not only photo document and document by hand, but you need to make good decisions and choose which stains am I going to collect because you're not going to swab that whole sidewalk. You're going to swab representative stains uh, that hopefully can identify maybe a victim or maybe a suspect or maybe both. Uh, we'll do some of this. Uh, this is luminol or blue star. That's a, those are chemicals that will make blood light up in the dark. Unlike TV shows, you do not need a special light to make this light up, right class? Um, all you do is you spray the chemical and it will light up in the dark. Okay, so that was my um, career as a DNA analyst, but don't forget there are different other uh, disciplines under the umbrella of forensics. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, fingerprints, trace evidence, firearms, photography, chemistry, question documents, all of these, um, they will entail using not only biology, chemistry, physics, um, all of the sciences. And that's what I love about forensics. Is it, it's not just one type of science you get to utilize many different types of sciences. And for Los Angeles County anyway, even if my graduate degree is in forensic molecular biology, that, that does not um, prohibit me from applying to move to the firearms unit. They will allow that. As long as you're hired as a criminalist, they will let you laterally move to a different unit if that's your interest. So that was a great thing about uh, working there. So just some pictures of what you may come across if you're in the fingerprints unit. Um, these were developed, finger, latent fingerprints, latent meaning you don't see it until you develop it. This is a comparison microscope. This is something you might see if you're in the trace unit. This is a fiber. Um, these two stages of the comparison microscope allow two different fibers to be compared against each other. I can't find my mouse, so here it is. Uh, so you have one stage here and one stage here and you check to see if there's a match. This is a scanning electron microscope. This is also something you might see if you're in the trace unit. You would use something like this to look at gunshot residue. Um, this microscope is extremely powerful. Um, 
any vibration, like if a car drives by the laboratory, it will you will not be able to analyze your evidence. So uh, our SEM at LA County Sheriff's was actually in the basement. So we wouldn't get the vibration from the 10 freeway. Okay, so chemistry, that includes narcotics or controlled substances. It includes toxicology or blood alcohol. But this was an interesting case. Uh, when I was a supervisor over narcotics, this was um, a really sad case, actually. Uh, the detective called me and said she had a onesie that had NyQuil, possible NyQuil on it. Um, and it was submitted to our controlled substances unit. What happened was um, a young mother had a two-year-old and a two-month-old. Um, and she, she, at the time she was living in a motel and she wanted to go out with her friends. Well, she left the two-year-old to watch the two-month-old. Uh, but before she left the room, she gave both of them NyQuil. When she came back, the two-year-old was sleeping and the newborn was kind of out of it. She, she told the detective that, oh, I picked him up and his head was just kind of wobbling around, um, but I didn't think anything of it. And then I called 911 when he stopped breathing. So that newborn ended up dying and this onesie came in and I, I assigned it to one of my analysts he did do it within 24 hours because this was a very important case. Whenever there's a child involved, it's, it's always immediately uh, an, important, an important case because it's very sensitive. Uh, and he, of course, identified that green-blue substance as NyQuil. I don't, I don't know if he testified for that case. I'm sure he did, but um, that's just something that would maybe come into the controlled substance, substances unit. I mean, along with all the little baggies of possible drugs that are confiscated off of arrestees. You might work with some big instruments like this. This is called a gas chromatographer mass spectrometer. And you might look at a lot of graphs like this. So not all of forensic science or CSI work is you know, active or lively or, or um, all that interesting because a lot of times you're gonna be staring into a microscope or you're gonna be studying these types of graphs and doing a statistic. Um, so just know that it's not all active and um, like manual labor. It's a lot of sitting at your desk, report writing and calculating things. Um, you may look at glass or hairs in glass. You may go out to a vehicle exam, a tow yard. Uh, so this should have been closer to the, that powerful microscope, but more images under the scanning electron microscope. If you're in the firearms unit, you may be uh, handling firearms, seeing if it's functioning properly. You may be looking at um, these tiny striations are on a bullet or on a cartridge case. And again, using the comparison microscope, you may be matching up striations on uh, bullets or cartridge cases. So that's just a little overview of what um, it would be like to work in a crime lab or work as a crime scene investigator, but what does it take to become a crime scene investigator? You must think, oh, I just need a strong stomach. That is not all. I mean, it is a big part of it. Um, crime scenes are hard. Uh, like I mentioned, you may work a full shift and then have to roll out to a crime scene and work a 19 hour shift in total. You have to learn to balance your work and home. You may have a spouse or partner, your pets, 
your kids, your family. Uh, just remember that you may do, be doing these 19 hour scenes, but after that, you gotta go home and walk the dog. I remember I had scenes and I, I had uh, two pugs. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're like probably wondering where I'm at. <laughs> but you just gotta remember to balance your life and the things that you may see may deeply affect you. I know that some of the things I have seen in my career as a crime scene investigator or forensic scientist are still with me and still affect me. I, I won't go to an ATM at night. I don't fill up gas at night. Um, and a lot of it is working in Los Angeles. It's very dangerous, but you just never know what will happen. Um, I put this in the, in the slideshow because I wanted to share with you. Uh, I did go out to a homicide where an adult male killed his own father. And we were there to do blood spatter analysis, or I was there as a trainee at the time. So I was, pre I was like a rookie criminalist. And uh, we were trying to decipher point of origin, where did the blood originate from? And I had to use the restroom. <laughs> the detective said, oh, just go use the one in the house. I'm like, what? Isn't there like a Starbucks or something? He's like, no, go use it. I just used it. And me being the rookie crim, I, I go use the bathroom and it looks like that. It's disgusting. And I have no choice because I had to go and I, I'm lining it with toilet paper, like five layers of it. And I'm short, so I can't like squat over it. I know this is TMI, but I can't squat over it. So I have to like sit on this five layers of toilet paper. And the whole time I'm using the restroom, I'm like, this is the killer's toilet. I can't believe I'm using the killer's toilet. I really can't believe it. So learn my lesson. Don't drink water before like, my blood stain pattern analysis crime scene. Most large cases will have a command post, and this is the most wonderful thing. Um, if you're there for 12 hours, you have this command post, it's air conditioned. They have pizza in there, they have donuts and coffee. Um, and most importantly, there is a restroom in there a nice one, a clean one with a faucet with paper towel. Uh, it's the best thing, best invention. So yes, it takes a strong stomach, um, endurance, but education and experience wise, am I over my time? No, you need to graduate high school. Um, apply for college. Uh, to do, to work in a crime lab, you will need, uh, you will need to major in a hard science, meaning one of these, chemistry, biology, physics, now forensic science, or any combination of the above. You can have a Bachelor of Arts, you look more diversified, but as long as your major is one of these hard sciences, you cannot major in sociology or history and, and um, want to work in a crime lab. It, it just doesn't, you won't get hired. I would suggest you intern or volunteer anywhere. And even if you think it might not be close to what you want to do, just get yourself out there because you don't know if someone at that place knows somebody at the crime lab. They, they very well may know someone there. But get that experience, get that networking, um, it's, it's really important. And like the Cal State LA campus, it's easy for them to do the internships and volunteer here in Hawaii. It might be a little, well, Kauai, everyone knows everyone. So <laughs> you might be able to network quickly, but super important to do that. A master's degree is not a requirement, but it is um, recommended because, because of all the TV shows and movies, these positions are highly coveted and one 
criminalist or CSI position is going to have over 100 applicants, I can guarantee you. I have been on the other side where we have um, looked through all of these applicants and uh, it's just overwhelming. You just have to look at, okay, what's the cream of the crop? So getting that master's degree will automatically give you that extra push. I, I will say that if you have your bachelor's degree, please don't be afraid to apply. You never know, you might, you might get um, uh, an entry level job in the crime lab, like a lab tech. That's very um, doable. I do wanna mention also in, on this slide, when I went to University of Oregon, my major was psychology. And I, I did have forensic science in the back of my head. And it was because in high school, one of my classmates said, oh my gosh, Carrie, you got to read this book. It was Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> and I'm like, what, what the heck is forensic psychology? Clarice Starling. Um, so that kind of got me interested in psychology. Well, after my first year at Oregon, I realize, you know, that's not really what I want to do. I'm more interested in um, biology or physics, like one of the harder sciences. And as I was evolving um, through my years in college, I thought, oh, since I'm in these chemistry and biology courses, shouldn't I be pre-med? <laughs> and so I, I thought about it and I volunteered at a local hospital, like I mentioned earlier, and I um, it just wasn't for me. I, I quickly realized I, medicine was not for me. And that's when I decided to go to Japan. <laughs> so you just never know where you will end up. Um, and changing your major multiple times during your undergrad is totally fine. It's actually probably a healthy thing to do because you're only 18 to 22 years old. You, you're still finding out who you are. Uh, one really important thing if you're interested in forensics is you will go through a background check or multiple background checks. And these are really easy to fail. Um, keep your record clean. And that doesn't mean just, okay, don't get arrested or don't get pulled over. It means stay away from people who commit crime too, even petty crime. Just stay away from those types of people because they will find out during your background check that you have associated yourselves with these types of people. Keep your finances in check. Don't get a credit card your freshman year in college and run up that bill uh, where you can't afford it because when you have debt, you will not get hired. I mean, there's good debt too if you buy a house or if you have a school loan. Those are considered good debt. But if you want to buy a Gucci purse, <laughs> just don't put it on your credit card. Social media. Be careful what you post. Um, be careful who you post with. I know one of my co former co-workers' daughter's um, Facebook page prevented her from getting hired, not as a criminalist, but another position in the sheriff's department. And she, her record was clean as a whistle, but she had a photo with someone with a gang tattoo or something like that. And that was a, an immediate red flag for them. And of course, your circle of friends and family, um, even family members can be bad apples. So um, if you wanna pass that background check, just kind of keep your distance from, from them. Public speaking, huge part of being a forensic scientist. You will testify this, as my students know, this is nerve wracking, can be really nerve wracking. You don't know what the defense will ask you. They will be hard on you. They will try to make you look um, that you're like you're not qualified. Testifying is a big part of your job and that is public speaking. You're not only talking to the jury, there is an audience, like anyone from the public can be in the, in the courtroom. 
you may train your colleagues or others. You may be training, like for um, LASD, for example, we would go out and train sworn officers on how DNA and how blood is collected just so that they know not, not what to touch or where to step. Um, so we're training law enforcement or, or sworn individuals and we're training each other. Um, I was on the robotics team. We validated some robotics to do DNA extractions all the way to DNA typing. And it was just four of us. So once we were done with the validation, guess what? We got to train the whole unit, all 55 of them on how this, hap this works, how the robot works, what you got to do. Uh, so you're, you're public speaking again. And then you may give presentations on your research. Um, big conferences, they want to know what's the next big, big thing. Um, so you may want to share what you have found, or you may be presenting at events like these. This is public speaking. I mean, I wish I could go to Kauai and <laughs> talk to uh, students in person, but this is all part of public speaking. And it's a big part of your job and you just need to get used to it. And it's not just forensic science, it's probably I would say 90 to 95% of, of the careers in the world include public speaking at some point. And that's all I have. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me. I'd be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Um, Jovleen, I think I said that right. If you have any questions about what you should be doing in high school, um, well, you're a sophomore, so you have time, but uh, maybe next year you can contact me if you have any questions about um, college or where you want to apply to or whatnot. Um, and are there any questions for me? Is, is it hard for you to watch? Does the TV and movies ever get it right? Or is it hard to watch because they don't get it right? Surprisingly, a lot of them, I mean, they glamorize it. They're, they're in nice clothes and their hair is perfect. And they're looking at a microscope in the dark with a blue light behind them. That's fine. But as far as the actual analysis, I would say a lot of them get it right. And I, it, I think it's because the, they call them technical advisors. They hire good ones. Actually, one of my former coworkers does that, or he did it for all the CSIs and Hawaii Five-0 and all, you know, a lot of those big shows. So I think they just hire the right people. Um, so a lot of it is right. Uh, I personally like, I don't know why, I like forensic files. It's like 30 minutes. Um, it's usually pretty accurate and it's, it's interesting, but um, once in a while, they'll they'll make up stuff, but it doesn't really bother me because it, it just makes it a little more interesting. Like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you think about the body of television and movies, I mean, forensics is is just a huge component these days. It's you yeah, know? It's, it's, it's all over the place. Yeah, even which is, um, which is digital great. forensics. And I'm, I'm glad that they get it right most because I think a lot of other science. It's so <laughs> implausible and they make it seem like it's real or I don't know, but so that's, yeah. uh, that's good that they have people, you know, and that's amazing. A hundred people for one job. That is, Over. I wasn't aware yeah. of that. That's crazy. Are there enough jobs for people though? I mean, can people generally find stuff or do they have to do other, what happens? <laughs> you know, I, I've seen... I've seen applicants reapply and reapply and reapply. And at some point they give up and they go into health care or, you know, some other science related field. And it's unfortunate because a lot of them are overqualified They're They'd be really good at it. There's just not enough, <clears throat> excuse me, spots mm -hmm. um, for all these applicants. But there are a lot of smart people out there. That's why the um, interning and volunteering is such a critical component of getting the job that you want. Um, that way, 
you just get to know the right people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Networking. I think just meeting people in, it helps you realize that you like it too, because yes, you get to meet that's the people exactly who right. do the work and experience it. It's yeah, that's, that's very cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, cool. And I mean, it's, it's so cool too, that you kind of came around to teaching and now it's like a, a whole, in a way, a whole new career and yet oh, yeah. amazing and, and uh, satisfying. It sounds like. It is very much. I I'm really enjoying it. We are very lucky to have Professor Indad Shaman on. Oh, thank very you. Lucky. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for choosing us. <laughs> <laughs> Jovaline, you should totally join Shamanad and take Professor in this class for forensic <laughs> science. We'll be waiting for you. Oh, well, now that we've made this connection, we'll certainly, if we don't get you over here sometime, uh, Professor Inda will definitely be in touch. And because, uh, yeah, that's just working with the I'm a Scientist STEM folks has been a great collaboration for us because, you know, we're we're really new and they've had so much time, but having the connection with, uh, you know, folks who've, who've done the job in, in the field. I mean, I can't imagine working in the LA police, LA County for, I mean, I just can't, I, I mean, I have no concept. I've never lived in a city that big, but just, uh, yeah, you must be just incredibly strong too, to just deal with all those circumstances. But then, you know, the impact you're making is so huge. It's, uh, I'm sure there's that that makes it, you know, balance can balance it out maybe. Yeah, it, it's definitely gratifying and fulfilling, especially when um, you see that case in like the LA Times and you had contributed to that conviction or that exoneration. Um, so at a shamanad, I have a different way of, <laughs> you know, having an effect on people. So. They're both very gratifying and satisfying jobs. Yeah. Well, we're really glad you're back in Hawaii too. That's uh, closer to all it of us. It is nice to be here. <laughs> it's really nice to be here. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody for joining.